Welcome folks, this is Blair Hensley at the Florida Cracker Trading Company. We're out at Mr. Steve Melton's farm today. We're about to make some pure sugar cane syrup. Why don't you come see how it's done? Follow me. What I want to do is explain the uh, process on how we squeeze the sugar cane. We take our stalks and we bring it into this cane mill, but we power it with a belt coming off of a Farmall H tractor that was, this one happens to be in the mid 40s. And as we come up to the cane mill, we, we put the sugar cane from here in through the rollers. And as this turns, you will see the you see the action of the sugarcane mill and it, the juice is squeezed between the rollers and it comes out and then we pipe it into our kettle and that's the process of actually squeezing it. old way would be over with a horse-drawn uh, cane mill that would go round and round and you would squeeze sugar cane the very old way and some still done that way but we are in production here so this is just the new old way. We're bringing up the impurities what we call the skimmings and you see we're forming a crust and we'll slowly bring that up to about 190 degrees and we'll pull all of this off the skimmings and get rid of that and in the meantime we are firing this with a with a wood burning furnace and and the heat goes all the way around the kettle and we can control the heat pretty well with this furnace and at 190 we will pull this and we will cook to 227 degrees and by that time, the, the sediments, I mean, the, the sugar solids get thick enough to where it makes the syrup just at the right consistency to pour on pancakes and biscuits. Blair, if you'll take one and just and keep it flat, kind of chase it around. There you go, perfect. Right there, let it drain and then put it in there. In the South, it was considered the everyday sweetener. Someone would have a mill and a kettle, and everybody had them a little cane patch. They would gather their cane and take it to someone that would cook down for syrup. Whatever deal they worked out, it might be that, that someone would bring their mule to help with the syrup grinding, or they'd bring wood, or they'd furnish all the labor. Whatever deal they worked out, then they might leave half of what the syrup they made. He would then take what he had and take it to a general store and, and sell it. And, and that's where he got his money out of. Today, it's a, considered a heritage art because everybody don't have time to do it. It takes a many hour before you get the cane into a bottle of syrup because you've got to grow it, you've got to tend to fertilize it, you've got to hoe it, you've got to strip it, top it, and then cut it, bring it to the mill, Take it from the off of whatever you brought it on a trailer and feed it through the mill, get the juice, and then cook it down to syrup. And it's a lot of time, and it seems like we don't have that time today to do that. And once it starts boiling and it'll start a roll going, we want to be sure and have the crust off by then. And then after the crust is off, we will bring the temperature up some more and we will really hit the heat to it and it'll start a beautiful foam going and then that's when we start uh, the process of filtration on it. When I was just a very small kid, maybe seven, eight years old, 
the community event was syrup cooking. Everybody get their little bit of cane together and they go down to Wendell Hoop's house. He had a, a kettle, not quite as fancy as this. He'd set it up on four steel stakes and just both build a fire under it. But it was a kettle the same as we're using here. Now, it was an event where uh, Ms. LaHoop would make biscuits and ham and sausage and everybody would have syrup on the biscuits and cornbread and such as that. One of the things that uh, uh, sticks in my mind was that old men would go down to the barn and we weren't allowed to go to the barn where they were. Uh, we didn't understand what was going on down there, but all we knew was that uh, they were walking funny and talking loud when they came out of the barn. Now, after the time of Mr. LaHoop making syrup, uh, a little later on, uh, I think the Bartles, Bartles made syrup. That is buy 25 gallons of syrup. I think it was a dollar a gallon. <laughs> uh, and that lasted us for a year. Apparently we used about a gallon a month. Now there were nine of us kids. We always had either oatmeal, grits and eggs, uh, country ham, and fresh biscuits that she made as she cooked it before we went to school. And now then it seems like that we're too busy for whatever reason, too many distractions for us to live as a, as a family anymore. Uh, we didn't we didn't eat 15 times a day, and you didn't get your special food that you wanted. You ate what was on the table. But we got more people making surf around here now than than back then. There's a lot of interest in people making surf. Uh, I can think of four or five that's right close in this area. We convinced the lawmakers that this system of make and serve in a cast iron kettle has been going on for over 200 years in the South and nobody has ever been harmed or got sick by using syrup that was made in a cast iron kettle. Obviously if you bring this liquid up to 200 27 degrees in temperature, but ain't much going to live through it. So uh, we do have a law that uh, exempts us if we properly label the bottles from any interference from overzealous health inspectors for the counties. There, there, there you go. Okay, I want to quote another poem about the skimmings here that we're taking out. And uh, this actually happened to a dear friend of Wilbur's and I and, Charlie, and, uh, and Melvin's named Charlie Kirksey. And this happened to his dad in Georgia. And so I want to quote this poem that, that actually happened. And we call it Goose Down. And it goes like this. Cooking and skimming sugar cane syrup on a cool December morn reminded old Rip of Vincent that happened in Colquitt, Georgia, town where he was born. Friend wanted to barrel the sugarcane skimmings. It was the last cooking of the year. He wanted to make a little moonshine or at least a little buck beer. They put the barrel behind the barn, but soon it was forgotten. Two weeks later, they smelled something bad. Those skimmings had turned plum rotten. Dad told the son to dump the barrel. You see, Junior, it's just too rank. dumped it in a lime pit behind the house, and boy, did it ever stank. About that time, the yard geese come a-waddling by. They run down and started lapping it up, and then began to die. Junior, running back to the house to tell Granny of the bad news, she said, well, you just bring them, put them on the front porch, at least the goose down we can use. Oh, it was a barnyard tragedy, the sight you seldom seen. Everyone started pulling goose down and they stripped those feathers clean. What now, Granny? This ordeal was about what Morn Jr. could take. She said, well, you just dump them in the woods across the field and be quick for goodness sake. That afternoon, after the shades were thrown, 
Sister looks out across that field and those geese was coming home. Resurrected from their stupor, back to life each one came. But it was all so embarrassing. They had no feathers to hide their shame. There's a lesson to this true story, more than what you might think. You could lo lose your clothes too, so be careful what you drink. <laughs> well, I never made it myself, but my daddy had a sugar kettle and a mill, Uncle Charlie, Uncle T, Uncle Julius, Uncle Tiny, all of them born back in the 20s and 30s, and that was just a part of their heritage every day. In the fall of the year, when it got real cold, the sugar cane got ready, all the people from town would come out, people like Frank Saxon, all the old timers, and they would all sit around and either drink beer or whiskey. And the young kids, they would go out and strip the, the leaves off the cane, harvest the cane, put it on an old sled and pull it back up to the mill. And after they did that, the adults would start running to the cane grinder and uh, put all your juice in there and start cooking it. They wasn't many people in Hernando County, so they didn't go to town very often. They raised everything they wanted to eat or they fished to catch the fish they wanted to eat, had them a garden. But it was a, a social event for people to get together. Just like once a year a church had a gathering and uh, dinner on the ground. But anytime somebody was grinding cane, everybody jumped in together and everybody helped each other. Eight or 10 families come out, all the kids get together go down to the branch and go swimming or tromping through the woods like little kids are supposed to do. So it was a, a unique experience to say the least anytime you got to go to somebody's cane grinding. But 30 years from now, people be looking at today about being the good old days. It's what people remember. And uh, every, every time a different generation comes on, everybody remembers something different because the times change and the people change but the land hardly ever changes. Land's always there. That's the only thing that'll always be constant is land. And people in agriculture were actually the first environmentalists because they knew if they didn't take care of the land, the land wasn't gonna in turn take care of them. The people, people in agriculture, they don't go out and destroy land. They try to preserve it because they know that each generation coming on is gonna need the land to produce food and fiber not only for Floridians, but for the rest of the world. It's just like Steve Milton, how he has saved part of the last 150 years of history of agriculture for younger people to see that never knew that this piece of equipment existed or this piece of equipment existed or how people used to be self-sufficient by making their own cane, their own sugar, their own candy, milking their own cows, slaughtering their own cattle and hogs, but it's just, a way of life for some people and after so many generations some of the younger people just want to get out of it. Now what we're doing we have just brought this up to a big big boiling foam and we have put a center ring in it and it, you see how it's coming over the side of the center ring it's filtering through some felt cloth that we have here and getting all of the finer impurities out and in the meantime we have a self skimmer in the middle that's taking the foam that way filtering it there and here and you can see just what we've done here in a little bit it's already turning the foam really white and as we keep cooking here in the next hour, that white foam will become more and more golden until we take it off and it'll be really golden then. And but so we can see the different stages, but right now this is working really good and it's filtering and every once in a while we'll pull these rags, wash them out, and then we'll keep filtering this for another hour or so. And so we're going to try to make this just as clean as we can. How did you get into making, where's your passion for making cane syrup? Well, it started with those two guys right there. I came up to uh, Pioneer Florida Museum in Dade City, and they were cooking, and I got interested in that. And Melvin taught me all the nuances of it, and I just have gotten a passion for it because I love to see the process 
And then the finished product of which you can put on pancakes and waffles and especially a buttered biscuit put in, split in two, there is nothing better. And so we're trying to go back and, and grab that heritage that we were raised with. And so this is the type of syrup that you can serve. And I mean, it's pure sugarcane syrup, no additives. It's just straight from the sugarcane stalk to the table. Well, I guess that'd be called organic, right? In this day and age, it's, it's, it's a oh. true, truly organic product that we have here. Yes, it, it, little, little fertilization, but not much. It, it didn't grab your interest when you were younger making syrup, or that, is that just part of everyday living making syrup? No, this is what's so strange. We were working too hard on the ranch to ever do this, and none of my family ever did it, like, like their families did. But I only saw it one or two times as a kid, but after getting into the museum work and collecting antiques and seeing how our, our, the heritage, this really grabbed me. So, so how will you use this? Well, considering you know, the Florida Cracker Kitchen, you know, we're gonna take it and uh, have your label, put our logo on it, and uh, get it out to two folks that can enjoy it that have never experienced what, what it means and then oh. the story behind it. You know, people ask, where does it come from? Of course, I, I, I give them the story that it's made here locally. It's made, mm -hmm. well, you know, with our own hands. It's not coming from a big production plant. And a local family makes this. And as, you know, for the Florida Cracker Kitchen, this is one of the true staples of, of a Florida Cracker, of our heritage in Florida, is pure sugarcane syrup. And when you start off, how much sugarcane juice after the grindings is in the kettle? And then when you get done cooking, what type of yield I mean, do you have from that amount of juice? That's a good question because this is a 60 gallon kettle and usually it turns out about 10 to one. 10 gallons of juice for one gallon of syrup. Now, because this has been cut a little while, it has a little extra sugar in the stalk. We might even get seven or eight gallons out of this one. And we'd fill the kettle up pretty full. So it's, but it's about 10 to one. So 10 to one. So this whole 60 gallon kettle might do seven gallons of syrup. A uh, couple weeks ago, we had uh, uh, my sugar cane cooking festival and had several hundred people here, but we open up our museum and we have a blacksmith come in and, and making things. One of the high end blacksmiths in the area had a rope maker and we had um, spinners on the front porch of the cracker house. And then we had about 15, uh, uh, bluegrass pickers and then we had corn shelling out here for, for everybody and it was just tractor rides and horse rides and it was just a wonderful event. I, uh, I write some cowboy poetry, and the type of cowboy poetry I do is cracker style, meaning from Florida and the South. And uh, this was an incident that happened to the K-Bar Ranch between Zephyr Hills and Tampa. And this actually happened. And the man who worked on the ranch and his wife told me this story, and it's true. And I call it the K-Bar Romeo. Down at the K-Bar Ranch, the breeding season was done. They gathered in all the bulls, that is all but one. He was a big brain of bull, he weighed more than a ton. He didn't want to leave his ladies. He was having too much fun. The cowboys went back with ropes in the trailer to show him who was boss. Little did they know this was a line he would never cross. Cooter took to him first, but hit a ditch and rolled his horse. Got banged up really bad when he hit the ground with all that force. Mike and Greg finally got him trailered and backed up to the pen. Little did they know the real trouble was just about to begin. 
They pushed him out of the trailer, but he doubled back quicker than a switchblade knife. Put Greg up on the trailer, scrambling for his life. Somehow he got into the barnyard and decided he would roam. He trotted across the field straight to Mike's mobile home. He jumped up on the front porch where there were flowers hanging in pots of terracotta. He started butting and swinging at them, just like you would a pinata. Mike ran past the beast to tell his wife not to go outside. A minute later, that bull busted through the front door of that single wide. They barely escaped to the back porch, scared and somewhat shaken. They couldn't believe how their home had just now been overtaken. Back in the house, mud and manure were oozing across the floor. And what made Tina really mad? He slobbered all over the sliding glass door. Mike called the owner to tell, a bull is in my kitchen, what should I do was his plea. Thinking it was a joke, Henry told him, well, why don't you serve him up some tea? That bull finally went out the front door and back to his herd he made a straight track. But he tore up three of the fences before he made it back. The cowboys all gathered up, had a meeting to lay their fears, and then it was all agreed. Why not extend the breeding season at least for two more years? That's good. And we're trying to go to 35 bomb. What we're doing now is we're taking a hydrometer reading, measuring the specific gravity of the solids in this syrup to get, make it at the right consistency, how thick it is. And right now it's 32 on the bomb hydrometer. And the bomb hydrometer and the, and the thermometer the thermometer should be about 227, and the bomb hydrometer is at 34, and they both are the same uh, thickness of syrup. And this is getting real exciting because we're just within a few minutes and trying to determine how thick it is at the right consistency is sometimes a little, a little tricky. Okay, let's start dipping. That's a 10 gallon kettle right there. Okay, pull the fire. We're gonna go right up here. Mountain, I want to thank you for letting us come out today and uh, showing us how you make the cane syrup, sugar cane syrup that we're serving here in the restaurant. And uh, man, I learned a lot today and I realized, you know, how, how, how life has changed a little bit in this short amount of time. And the amount of work that it takes to go in that, which you helped so well. And and it has been a just a joy to have you out and all of your, your restaurant crew and everything came out so good and the syrup came out well. and. It was a perfect day. Well, hey, well, you know what? I appreciate you keeping the, you know, tradition going and teaching folks about how to do something that was done back in the day. So, well, thank you again for for doing, it. and let's do it next year if it works out. Hey, if you invite me, I'm here. Good deal. Thank you, Mr. Melton.